You're listening to Unleash Your Potential with Mary Nawabi, where you learn to discover your best self. Here's your host, Mary Nawabi. All right. Well, welcome to Unleash Your Potential podcast with Mary Nawabi. And today I have a very, very honored guest. Um, his name is uh, Sam uh, Chauhan, and he's known for a mental toughness coach and inspires and motivates a lot of people. A few months ago, I had the pleasure of experiencing some of his work through one of our seminars that was put together by our organization through Tom Ferry. Uh, It was all of the coaches and it was a phenomenal experience and I've learned a lot of great things from Sam. So I made a mental note to make sure that I invite him to my show. So that way we could share a lot, a lot of his great knowledge with the rest of the world. So Sam, welcome. Well, thank you for having me, Mary. I appreciate being on the show. Yes, absolutely. So let me quickly kind of read your bio. Sam Chauhan's mindset coaching techniques are truly revolutionary. He is the industry leader and has been talked about in major press outlets, including ESPN, the Chicago Tribune, NBC, and Time Magazine. Why is everyone talking about Sam? One word, results. Sam transforms people, enhancing and dramatically improving the quality of their lives. As he coaches professionals from the athletic and business world, celebrities and CEOs, he astonishes the world with his phenomenal results. Whether he is motivating homeless people to succeed, encouraging progress with corporations, or inspiring individuals to gain confidence, his results are profound. Sam possesses a wide variety of skills. His years of success have made him an expert in neurolinguistic programming, which we call NLP, quantum physics and mechanics, subliminal linguistics, and clinical hypnosis. Wow, those are mouthful, right? Yeah, they are. (laughs) (laughs) So today I want to talk about fear and you know my personal experience has been in the past that I didn't know how much fear actually stops us and you know the majority of public if if we ask what what are they fearing the most they would reply oh I fear nothing I remember I think it was two years ago we went to Tony Robbins event and I took my whole family with us. And when we came back in the car, my, my only focus was to recognize the fear that I was facing and what type of fear I was facing. So in the car, we were having a conversation. I asked a few of the family members and I said, so, so, and so what do you think your fear is? And I was still surprised that 90% of people in that car said, well, I don't have any fear. Uh, that's just all in your head. And so most people would think that, you know, they're not fearing anything and their response would be inaccurate because few people realize that they are bound, sometimes handicapped, even whipped spiritually and physically through some form of fear. So, and they're so subtle, right? And deeply seated that the emotion of fear, sometimes even we go through life never recognize its presence right right Right. so so i agree yeah so so this is like for average person where i was probably a few years ago so tell us what is fear and what is your experience what's your input so as a kind of looking at it from a general perspective and how would people recognize if they are facing with fear and what type of a fear Right. So first reason is that most people don't admit that they have fear is uh, because of their ego. And the definition of ego is a perception we create to feel better about ourselves. Mm. So they created their own illusion 
that they have no fear. But their ego is the one who creates that illusion because some reason people think that having fear is weakness. So having too, a little bit of fear is necessary because if you have a little bit of fear, you might not walk so close to the cliff. If you have a little bit of fear, you might not touch the fire. You know, so having a little bit of fear is okay. It's right. I was, just, I was uh, you know, uh, I just did my event last uh, last week in Vegas. So I had Rob O'Neill. Rob O'Neill's the Navy SEAL that killed Osama bin Laden. Mm. Um, so, so he was with me, and he, we we talked about it also that you gotta have a little bit of fear. It's okay, but when you live in fear of taking risks, that's not gonna get you killed, right? You're taking risks, whether it's in life, whether it's following your passion, whether it's uh, doing things you're a little bit uncomfortable with, uh, that's where the challenge comes in. Fear is fear is only, fear only happens in the future. Um, and that's really interesting for people because people don't really understand that. It's like stress. Stress only happens in the future. When people hold on to the past, they're, that's called forms of depression, when you're holding on to the past. When you worry about the future, you, that can be called anxiety, stress. That can also be called fear because you're worried about what's about to happen. And the sad part is that either we're worried about a world that's already happened, that we can't do nothing about, or we're worried about a world that's only in our imagination that hasn't even happened. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. Yes. So what happens is the present, where life happens, the now, never gets lived. So fear is something that is necessary, but it also is something that bounds you. If, if, and, it, and it bounds you from achieving all the things that you got to achieve. So, so the first step is you got to take your ego out. And once you take your ego out, your fear is naked, meaning that now you are aware of your fear. Now you can do something about that fear. But that's the challenge that, Mary, we have, is that we have to understand that fear happens in the future. It's in our heads. So when you ask yourself a question, is that how do I grow? Well, growth only happens when you're uncomfortable. Growth only happens, it's like, you know, building a muscle. When you build a muscle in the gym, you're lifting weight. Well, your muscles have to break apart. So it has to become uncomfortable. And once it becomes uncomfortable, it goes back together and it's bigger. So that's how growth happens. So you have to be able to take those risks. Does that make sense? Of, of course it does. Yes, absolutely. Of course. Now... How did you overcome your fears or how did you recognize? I mean, for me, I, mean, I can share that. For me, like I said, there are times and instances. I've been in the real estate business for a long time. I was in sales and then I started doing coaching for Tom Perry. And now I'm kind of transitioning out of Tom Perry. I'm going to be doing my own coaching program. And it's for me, I didn't recognize. I mean, you hear it or you read it in books that people talk about fear and some of the quotes kind of resonate with you, but you really have no clue. It's like in your blind spot. It's like you don't know what's stopping you, right? You have no clue yourself. So for me, it was just like when I got introduced to this, to real feel it and how much is stopping me was through like Tony Robbins. I went to the event. I've, I've gone to so many of his events because I got trained by him as a coach. And I was like, oh my God, it's this fear thing is like holding me so much and, and it paralyzes you at times and, and you recognize you're not making progress, you're holding yourself back and that's job of a fear. And that was my biggest like aha moment. Um, like I told you, I took my family, my son who's 14 right now, and at that time he was 12. I, I, took, I took my son with us to Tony Robbins event and he was in the front row seat. Well, although we did not get the front row seats because they're so, you know, high ticket items, but he is so courageous. He found the seat in the front row and he just took that seat. And he texted me, he goes, mom, I think there's an empty spot. I'm gonna take it. I'm like, you can't take that. You have to be purchasing that ticket. He goes, well, that's what you think. I'm sitting here, so nobody's telling me anything. <laughs> <laughs> you there, right? I was fearful, like, well, I'm not supposed to be doing that. 
but he's he asked the question and then i guess he raised his hand and then tony said you young man i want to talk to you why are you here so i witnessed tony's interaction with my son on stage it was first time as a mom i realized how much fear was holding him back and i was like oh my god so this is what holds all of us back that was yeah. like and it, aha moment yeah and, and and it's crazy because it starts when you're when you're a kid it, exactly. it starts from yeah it starts it starts from how your families are structured it starts from what people you know what your you know parents tell you and family tells you and so you get conditioned all your life believing certain things and you know like you know you know this very well like you know who you are is what your last 5 years of your life experiences that made you it's so, so it's not you know it's not you know it's who you become not who you really are right it's who yes. you became over the yeah. last 5 year experience so when you're a kid you get conditioned all these things and then you become an adult you experience opposite things and then slowly some things you're open to changing but you know when you look at the word belief the definition is something you're certain about so how do you change your beliefs on fear if you believe that it's if if you have a belief which meaning is something you're certain about very hard so that means that your brain you have to override your brain you have to override your brain in its thinking in order to go further than being going on the other side of fear you have to be able to override it even though you everything is telling you don't do it don't do it you're like i got to do it and you got to override it and that's very hard for people to do because so you know how many beliefs that you have right now that limit you from going to the place that you really want to go and they limit you because you still believe that everything you believe is true yeah. and so the way the way you change it is that you have to first think of something in the past that you thought was true and you believed it was true but then you found out it wasn't you know yeah. the example that I like to give everybody in my seminars is that you know in in the past that we used to think that pluto was a planet well guess what a few years ago scientists say pluto is no longer considered a planet but i could have bet the house when i was younger that's what they told me so once you realize that now your brain becomes aware becomes open to realize that there might be other beliefs that you have in your head that might not be true and once that happens mary everything changes That's because cool. now you become more open for learning new things for putting new beliefs on them see you know everybody tells the story you know uh, about Roger Bannister the guy who broke the 4 minute mile yes and what was amazing was no human being ever broke the 4 minute mile and that that's not even for me that's not even what's amazing what's amazing is that same year 20 some other people broke the 4 minute mile and the only difference was that they got conviction that somebody else can do it they can do it so it opened it up in their brain the block got opened up and they were able to achieve those things so so a lot of things in life are conditioned that way you know when when a baby elephant gets brought into a circus they tie a chain around its ankle i don't condone this but that's what they used to do is that they tie a chain around its ankle the baby elephant uh has to sleep and eat in the same spot as the baby elephant becomes an adult elephant it has enough power enough energy to break itself free and go free but it doesn't it still eats and sleeps in the same spot now what's even more amazing is that if you take an adult elephant and you stop feeding it and you put food 10 feet away that adult elephant will die of starvation instead of breaking the chain it has enough power to break the chain but it won't it'll wow. still die of starvation right and that's how many of us are that everything we want is 10 feet away but the block that we created out of fear stops us from going to that level stops us from getting to that point where we can do that so people a lot of times will say you know it's great but you know like i just have bad luck you know hey, i just have bad luck <laughs> love that one yes yes i love that one you know Yeah. The, the people people just have this conversation because our brains are kind of weird because we justify everything good or bad we're going to justify why it happened we're going to because our ego has to be satisfied we have to justify yeah. you know but 
in reality, there is no good or bad experience. See, good or bad experience is a label. And the only reason you put a label to it is to satisfy the, la the ego. To satisfy the ego, you put a label whether an experience is good or bad. The reason you cannot say your experience is good or bad, unless you knew you were going to die tomorrow, then you can say this was bad, that was good, this was bad based on my beliefs. But the reason you can't say an experience is good or bad is because you don't know whether that experience is necessary for you to make a decision in five years that helps you get to where you always wanted to get to. So for you to label an experience is immature. For you to label an experience as the work of your ego, again, coming back to the definition, a perception you create to feel better about yourself. So imagine how your stress levels would be, which is fear of the future, that's what stress really is, fear of the future, is that imagine how low your stress levels would be if you didn't label your experience. Wow. Right? Very so if you didn't way. label your experience, you would not be stressed. Right, right, exactly. Right? right. So, so that's how powerful it is to understand by not labeling, taking the ego out, you change everything. You change how you, or you act with your friends, how you act with your family. You change everything because you're not living in a world that hasn't happened and you're not fearful of the world that hasn't happened because you know that everything that happens needs to happen for you to become the man or woman that you're about to become. So let's, let's identify, you know, a few of the symptoms per se uh, for fear because I think, you know, I'm imagining if this was like seven, eight years ago, this was me and I wouldn't know if it's fear or not that's holding me back and in terms of creating success. And when I mean success, you know, the real definition of success is to aim for something, to accomplish something, to, you know, fulfill a purpose. So whether that means you want to make more money or you want to create more love for your family or for your relationship or create health and vitality. So success doesn't mean always in terms of money. So it could be anything. Uh, and of course, success means different things to different people. Uh, but so in terms of like symptoms, so we could help some of the listeners, because uh, the ultimate goal is we want to help some individuals to recognize, have some awareness, right? That, okay, I've got some fear and these are the types of fear I've got. And this is what's holding me right now. So. I know that, you know, I was reading last night, rereading uh, the book, Think and Grow Rich. It's one of my favorite book and I always have it in my bathroom. <laughs> I just, it's my reference book. I always go back and review it. And I was looking at some of the symptoms that they were talking about it too. And then please add some um, if you can, so that way we could help some people to recognize what are they facing with. So some of the common stuff, like symptoms for fear was like lack of ambition right? Laziness, uh, lack of initiation. Um, and this initiation, it brought some memory back when you were at the event. You had something, you, you pulled the money out of your pocket and you said, I've got some money, who wants to come and get it? And how many people walked up to you? It's only one person or somebody, right? Uh, so not being able to initiate. Remember that? Yeah, that, so that, that was a little exercise I do. And it's actually a really good uh, exercise on fear, actually. It's where I go, look, I have an envelope. In the envelope, I have something written down. And it might say that you might have to dance up here. You might have to sing a song up here it's, uh, or act like a chicken, walk around the whole place. Uh, it, it says one of those three things. I need one person to come up. And, and you see nobody comes up. Yeah. And the, and, the, and the fear is really, you go deeper on that. It's, it's actually feeling significant with their peers of course meaning that their worry is how people would perceive them if this didn't work out yeah or if this doesn't go right that's where you know where it really comes down to that but when you and, and the problem with that uh and i'm going to just steer a little bit away i know we're sure. discussing this is that is that we have to really understand how this comes about 
in a relationship, husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, there's really no true love. The definition of tr true love is unconditional love. Yep, absolutely. It's the love that you have for your son. Yep. Right? No matter what, you're going to love your son. As long as you're mentally stable, you're, you're going to love your son. And, and that's unconditional love. Love in a relationship is that if you do this, I'm with you. If you do this, get the hell out. Right. Okay? right. It's, it's, with lo it's love with condition. Mm -hmm. The person that we forget to have true love for is ourselves. Very true. When you have true love for yourself, the rest of the world doesn't matter on how they perceive you because you know who you are. Right. And true love for yourself is very hard for people because how are you going to love somebody? It's like this. If I see somebody who's begging for money outside and he asks for a dollar and I don't have a dollar in my pocket, can I give him a dollar? No. Nope. No. So how am I supposed to give love to anybody if I don't love myself unconditionally? So, so finding those things are very important. So a lot of fear comes in is because of lack of love for yourself. That's and great too. What, it, a lot of people don't see that though. See, like it's not conditioned in our society. Love yourself. Oh my God, you're full of yourself. Right. It's most important to love yourself. So anyway, continue on. But, but no, that's a very good point because that's the foundation for everything in life. Um, I remember having this exercise. Um, I, I coached this one gentleman and um, you know, average people, they're very highly, highly critical of themselves, right? And that's how it tells you how much they love themselves. I gave him this one exercise. I said, find a go clicker, like you could click, 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 you know? And I said, I want you to be the self observer of yourself. How many times a day do you self criticize yourself? Like for example, oh, I ate this, I, I hated that, I shouldn't have ate that. Oh, my stomach is coming out. Or, oh, look at my nose, or, or oh my God, and my skin, like, oh, oh my God. So I said, anything that has to do with negative feeling about yourself, I want you to click this, and I want you to write down how many times you clicked it, and send that to me by the end of that day. It was like by 9 a.m., he texts me, he goes, forget it. He goes, I can't even count how many times I'm criticizing myself. Right. It's only 9 a.m. Right. So you're right. right. That self criticism. Yeah. So yeah. if you don't feel good about yourself, how are you going to, like you said, how are you going to love somebody else? Because that reflects back, right? They say, right. So, if you criticize somebody else, it's because 10 times we criticize ourselves. Absolutely. And the thing is, like in that situation, you could actually even help break his pattern. And, and the way you would do it, so many people are aware, right? They're aware they don't do this. They're aware they don't do that. The problem is getting you to do what you don't want to do sometimes. Yep. You know, that, that, that's the hard part. But first, you got to break that pattern, meaning that you got to rearrange the neural pathways. And I'm sure, you know, your listeners know what neural pathways, if not, uh, I'll give you just a quick example. Like when well, you go please, brush your yeah, teeth. Yeah, give us an example because I don't think, you know, average people, they wouldn't know what that is. Yeah. Yeah. And just so you know, you know, in this knowledge field is that it's very important to understand is that everything we do, good habits, bad habits, habits there's neural pathways that are created. So when, when somebody has a bad habit, they do it over and over again, and it becomes ingrained in their brain. And they do it without even thinking. They do it that way. So, for example, when you guys go brush your teeth, you brush your teeth, you grab the toothbrush with the same hand, you grab the toothpaste with the same hand. It's conditioned over time. So if I told you tomorrow, go do it with the opposite hand, it'll be very hard for you to do. So your, your neural pathways are created. So when people talk bad about themselves or they have negative self-talk is what I like to talk about. That's what I talk about in my book. Is that negative self-talk happens because you created a pattern of doing that. So easiest way to break that pattern, because you've got to have an ability to break the pattern once that's happening. There's a little technique that everybody in the house can use, whether it's negative self-talk, whether it's to get yourself focused, whatever it may be, is put a rubber band on your wrist. And anytime you hear yourself say something negative or get unfocused, pull back the rubber band and snap it. The brain will consciously have to focus on the pain on the wrist so it gets away from that negative thought 
and now you consciously know you need to focus on something positive or get refocused in what you were doing. Now, if you do that every single time, you'll create a new neural pathway that you'll be conditioned not to have that negative self-talk or get unfocused in those moments. That's called breaking the pattern using the rubber band. Um, give you another um, breaking the pattern technique that you can use. Um, another one is, let's say, for example, you're getting an anxiety attack, which most types of anxiety attacks is because of what you created in your head, overwhelming your brain. Yes. So one of the te techniques you can use is that this technique uh, like I have fun with my audiences, I tell them that I can, I can get rid of every single thought in their head except one. And they're like, I don't think you can do that. I said, I promise you I can do that. And what I would ask them to do is hold their breath as long as they can. And there'll be a moment, a split moment, where every single thought in your head will disappear except I need to breathe. <laughs> that would be a pattern interrupt. Yeah. Okay? It's actually really crazy. So, so that would interrupt your pattern also. So there's many different ways to do it, but it's very important to put those triggers in place because what that technique of making him aware was great, Mary, because now he's aware that this is, he talks negative all the time. The next step to that would be is him to make that actual change and he needs to have that pattern interrupt happen every time. Exactly. It was, it was very fascinating because he said, and when people are ready to interrupt that pattern, and he said, so how can I get rid of this? Now, I knew that he was ready because first he realized, because I wanted him to realize how he was so, his self-image was so negative. He's like, how can I get rid of this? This is so toxic. And then, you know, we talked about different strategies. Um, this rubber band thing, so how often should people do it? Of course, it depends on the complexity of the habit, right? Because some habits you could just take it out easily. Other habits, you know, like smoking, quitting to smoke, and some other habits might be difficult. How often, like what's the average? Is it like a week, two weeks, or every time you have them? No. So, so I, I have my clients have them on for a month, month and a half to okay. break those negative patterns. So anytime they see themselves going into a rut uh, where they're talking bad about themselves, that would be something that snaps them back on. And the reason is because if, it, if you have a, you know, a, a bad habit of having negative self-talk for years, well, you're going to have to break the pattern. Pretty, It's a strong pattern. It's a strong neural pathway you created. So sometimes you got to work a little bit harder to get those up. But all that's doing is breaking the pattern of thinking. And then you got to create yourself a positive pattern. Uh, positive neural pathway and that's the whole idea of that I mean it, it goes more in depth with some clients some some clients will do some kinesthetic anchoring which is a whole nother show but um, but that's the main purpose of breaking the pattern you got to break your pattern one way or another and using psychology is very important like you know I got invited to an office where one of the biggest challenges in that office was that people would talk bad about each other bad about the company and the broker said, hey, you know what? I need this to change in this office, and I need your help to get this pattern away from people to where they gossip. So no problem. Let's do it. So what I do, I got everybody little tiny water guns. I did a meeting, got everybody little water guns, and the rule was very simple. I said, if you catch anybody talking bad about somebody, bad about the broker, bad about the people in there, so all our idea is to be positive and to go to the next level. What I want you to do is if you hear anybody that talks personal bad things about anybody in this office, I want you to pick up the gun with a little, it's a little water gun and squirt them right in the face. And I said, if you do that, the broker is going to give you a $500 bonus. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. okay. So talk about breaking patterns, right? Yeah. So, Guess what? Because I wanted to give enough leverage for somebody to do that where they're like, I'd rather take the 500 than people talk bad about each other. So, so that right there was breaking the pattern of the office, the energy of the office. And guess what happened? This is, I think it's going now in three years. And he said maybe there was a couple incidents where he had to pay $500. But after that, everyone got conditioned that they wouldn't talk bad about each other to everybody. Wow. And it became, but that's called breaking pattern yes. using pain and le pain and pleasure concept, which is an NLP com uh, uh, concept. And and because you know people are more motivated by the fire behind 
behind them then motivated by the carrot in front of them yes of course of course absolutely wow you know i've got i'm gonna try the uh i, I have heard about the rubber band but uh you know i'm gonna try that i've, I've got to break a pattern i have uh it's with sweets anytime i eat it's like i have a cup of tea And then it's like, it's a pattern that I gotta have something sweet with it. And sometimes I'm not even hungry. It's just like, it wants it. It's not even me, it wants it. So I'm gonna use that pattern because I've got a, a, a goal to, to break that. And I've tried different things, which sometimes it works, but I'm gonna try this one and I'll, I'll text you after a month. All right, awesome, <laughs> awesome. Yeah, thanks for that. So going back to the some of the symptoms of the fear, I know we kind of got excited about talking about these other items, which are very important too. So some of the symptoms that people, if they recognize, if they are dealing with some sort of fear, it again, going back to its lack of ambition, laziness, uh, lack of initiation, um, lack of imagination, lack of enthusiasm, and lack of self-control. And the other thing that um, I know that when people are indecisive, right, they're kind of like, they're like, I don't know if I should do this or if I shouldn't. And it's because their fear, they have the fear that if they do it, what are the consequences like you talked about, or if they don't, so that they're always indecisive. And of course, the, the other biggest thing that you mentioned too is, is worrying. So that's also a sign of that you're dealing with a symptom of fear self-doubt it's huge 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 and um over cautious and then also procrastination anything you want to add you think that might show up in people's like real life symptoms that it's a sign of fear that they're dealing with that they could have some awareness yeah i mean i think uh, all those are 100 correct i i think that the moment you are uncomfortable you know you're dealing with fear in mm. anything okay yeah. um so because you can't get uncomfortable without being fearful definitely definitely and what is your advice for people to if they feel uncomfortable how would they embrace that fear because you know some people talk about oh um eliminate fear because you like you said If fear is, is hardwired into human beings, we can't eliminate it 100%, but we could learn how to embrace it, work with it. So what do you recommend how to work with fear? Well, you use it, I mean, some, like I said, there's some places where it's necessary to have fear, but where it, you know, you have to be able to differentiate what types of fear you have. Like people say, well, you shouldn't have fear at all. It, uh, that's not true. Yeah, that's <laughs> Ma- not accurate at world, all. Yes. <laughs> that, imagine this world without any fear. But there are things that you got to override. So if, imagine if your if your belief structure was that if I'm feeling uncomfortable, for example, if I'm feeling uncomfortable waking up early and going working working out, I need to override that. I need to embrace that uncomfortable feeling and just do it. So I think you have to just realize that you have to override your system. You have to override it and just make it happen. And, and that's really hard. Imagine if you embrace being uncomfortable, where would your life be? Right. If you embrace being uncomfortable, where would you go? Where would you go in life? In, in, you know, but see, the, the other problem with that is that, let's go a little bit further, is that most of us, we think we are going to a next level by, by imitating other people. For example, somebody wears a Kobe Bryant jersey or a Michael Jordan jersey, they start believing that they're Kobe Bryant. They think they have greatness now because they wore someone else's jersey. Yes. So most people live their lives through other people. Like, you know, you go to a sporting event and you see people like, yeah, we did it, we won, woohoo! <laughs> What did you win? You know, the, the, the vendors made the money. Yeah. The, the team made the money. What did you win? Yeah. Imagine if you had that <laughs> I love same that. passion, same excitement in your own life. Imagine where your life would be. Where would your business be if you showed that same enthusiasm? So right? people 
people live their success, people live their lives through other people. What you got to find is, look, if I'm feeling uncomfortable, you know what? This is my time to grow because you only grow when you're uncomfortable. If you have the belief that, well, every time I feel uncomfortable, I'm growing. Oh my God, I need to feel uncomfortable. You would approach it with incredible fire. You would approach it with being proactive. You would approach it with passion. You would have all kinds of things going your way, but we don't do that because we're so concerned. What if we let everybody down? What if, um, you know, people don't like me? What if people say bad things about me? So, so that's where the problem happens. Some people can't deal with haters. And, you know, haters is a major problem out there because people think it's a problem. What people don't realize is you've got to have haters in order for you to grow. Right. Because most of the world, since they never followed their own dreams, they never took chances on what they want to accomplish. They put down other people that are trying to accomplish their dreams or other people who took chances and might not work. They put those people down so they can feel better about themselves. Absolutely. They actually did research on this. They wanted to find out is why do people, why do people, when something's wrong in your life, why do people want to sit in front of you? They want to take you out for a drink, take you to a dinner, and try to talk about, you know, what happened. They found that when people sit in front of you, then you're telling them your problem. They're saying to themselves, thank God my life is not screwed up as hers. Tell yep. me more. Yep. They actually feel better about themselves. Yeah. So, so you, you have to recognize that part. But, uh, but if you attach being uncomfortable to growth, you're going to go to a whole different level. Yeah. And I think that being uncomfortable under your own terms, because there's a lot of other things that people could do to put themselves in a situation that they're stepping outside of their comfort zone, but then you ultimately have to have a passion and a drive. Because if you, for example, if you tell me today, hey, Mary, um, and, and my biggest fear, I'll, I'll share my biggest and deepest fear. My biggest fear is height, okay? Airplane, jumping off of airplane, parachute, and going on these crazy rides, I'll never do it. I'm afraid of heights. Now, if you say to overcome that, and I look at it, well, how is that going to help me if I jump off of an airplane? I don't know if that serves my purpose in terms of my, my passion, my goal for life, helping people. But if you say that, you know, what is your next biggest fear, deepest fear? I would say losing my family, losing my children. I have two children I adore. I love my husband. Um, although we've gone through a lot of ups and downs, but I really love what we've created. So that's my biggest fear. Now, if I make myself uncomfortable, right, in terms of overcoming or embracing that fear, that it would help me because my only, it's a positive thought process that you love your family, but if I'm too attached, then it has a negative consequences because what if something happens to them because I have no control over that? Um, and then what if something happens to them? You put your mind and focus so much into that because God forbid if something happens to them, then I could be devastated for life, right? And so that would be a good fear to embrace to say, okay, well, I'm not in charge of their life or destiny. If something happens to them, it's God's way of doing it. I'll find another way to find fulfillment. That would serve me well to like make myself uncomfortable to embrace that. But if you tell me to go jump off of an airplane and parachute, I'm going to say, I don't know about that. That really doesn't. Well, the thing is, the thing is, you're, when you worry about things you don't have control over, it's a complete waste of energy. But it's everything, every, it, everything is a perspective. So if I, you know, I was hearing this great thing is that imagine, you know, if I, you have a 14 year old, right? Yeah. Okay. So what, imagine if I threw a brick and, and, uh, and uh, made him fall down. Yes. Would you, would you be happy with me or no? No, of course not. I'll come and no, kick your ass. If, <laughs> <laughs> but what if, but, but, but what if, I saved him from falling off the cliff. Oh, of course, you'll be my hero. I'll be your hero, right? Yeah. So, so it comes it comes down to perspective on on things, and when you when you worry about things you don't have control over, then it's just a waste of energy. So you got to realize that you can only worry about things you have control over. 
Sometimes you can do everything right, and the and the outcome might not be what you want. Yeah. But it's an outcome that is necessary. And you don't know why, but you have faith that it's necessary. So there's there's two things that guide every human being, which is fear and faith. Okay. And the, and what fear and faith have in common is that they're both imagination of tomorrow. The difference between fear and faith is that fear is a negative imagination of tomorrow. Yes. And faith is a positive imagination of tomorrow. Yeah. So if you're gonna think, so if you're gonna think of tomorrow, you always want to think of it out of faith. But there are some things you just don't have control over, and you just can't worry about it. So the moment you start embracing fear, the better it's gonna be. My first speaking engagement that I had, I had maybe 30, 40 people in the audience, and 30, 40 people, and I froze on stage. And meaning that uh, this was like 14 years ago, yeah. 15 years ago. I, I didn't, I didn't even know what to say. I started sweating. I started, you know, I just walked off. I walked off stage. So oh, you it, walked off stage. Piece. I walked off stage. <laughs> that's my first, that's my first speaking engagement that I have. Yeah. And then, then the guess what? I had like four of them scheduled for the next two weeks. So I had to do it again. Good for I you. I got to do it again. And hopefully I make it work. And, and then something crazy happened. I was speaking um, at a conference in uh, Vancouver. with uh, I was the keynote speaker and uh, Deepak Chopra was the other keynote speaker at that conference. And um, so I was speaking at the conference and I have an intro video. I got, you know, I, got, I had a PowerPoint for the crowd. So... I'm, they're announcing my name and my intro video is supposed to go on. It doesn't go on. Uh, and then I get on stage and the PowerPoint didn't work. <laughs> so now I have to do a, you know, the whole presentation without anything. And I just, you know, obviously I can do that because this is something, my passion is something I practice. But there's not, there was nothing I can control. People say, well, weren't you fearful that, that your production wasn't, you, you know, your message wasn't as it should have been? I said, no. The message was the way it needed to be at that moment because the uh, things that happened were out of my control. So I had to go on and still create a very powerful content that can help somebody change their life. It's all yeah. good. Wow. Because life is like that too, right? We just have to pivot and, and embrace yeah. it. What? You're right. And because in my new book, I talk about the black cloud. So either in our life, we're in a black cloud or we're out of a black cloud or we're going towards the black cloud. And the black cloud represents challenges. So one thing for sure, there'll be another black cloud. Yes, and, for sure. Yeah. And once you become aware of that, life doesn't become so filled with uncertainty. Life doesn't come filled with fear. Life becomes, no matter what happens, I'm going to get through it, above it, under it, around it, no matter what. If you took that belief system, life goes at a whole different level. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think this embracing uncertainty is such an important piece of the puzzle for, like you said, creating that, you know, ultimate life that we have no control over what's going to happen in the future. And you just have to reprogram your brain say well because most people were like we think that life is going to happen this specific one way that we have imagined it in our head but it doesn't happen that way right so that was a great example that you know your presentation didn't go according to your plan and the video but you know what that was a great uh, lesson for everybody else to like hey this is you adjust and you pivot and you you make it happen so yeah you're yeah. done I, I remember my, you know, I had public speaking was one of my goals to tap into. I think when I was a child, I always used to like take the newspaper and pretend that I was a newscaster. I thought I was going to become a newscaster. Um, and then as an adult, because I had so much self-doubt the way I was brought up, I was brought up in Afghanistan. And so my self-image was just so low and my confidence was low. And so, but I had this, this vision and I, my vision boards, you know, we always have done vision boards because I was in sales and believed in self-improvement. So I always had this, like a lady speaking in front of a large audience. And I always had it on my vision board. I had it for five years. I didn't even know why I had it. 
And one day someone asked me, so why do you have this lady public speaking? I said, I don't know. She's like, you don't know why you have this on there? I said, no, I don't. And then it made me question, it's like, this is stupid, I have it, I don't know why I have it. And then I was like, oh, I should go take Toastmasters. And that helped me tremendously because my first sales pitch in real estate, I had to stand up and do the sales pitch, you know, like, oh, my listing's coming on the market. And I was like, sweaty palms, shaking, and I was just like, oh my God, that was such a mess. And I need to take... Uh, Toastmasters and another um, team member that we were masterminding and he's like oh you should you should take Toastmasters and then it helped me tremendously to just feel comfortable in my own skin and to be able to ultimately help a lot of people because you get so focused into yourself like you said the ego it's like you're no longer the important part in your life it's like I'm going to help out others and that part becomes like a source of energy you know, it's like you, that, that gives you so much energy. It's like, I call it the bottomless pit of energy that you never run out when you have that. No, you're 100%, yeah, you're 100% right. I mean, I, I do a special class I've been doing for years. It's, um, it's crowd hypnosis where you learn the ability. So we basically film everybody that comes in there, do a little quick presentation. We film them and then we teach them crowd hypnosis, uh, the aspects of subliminal command with the audience and making it, because whenever you have a strong message that you're trying to give out, it needs to be 50% content and 50% um, entertainment. If the, that number is mixed up, you're either going to have a very boring presentation or you're going to have content or you're going to have a presentation that has no knowledge in it, but you got to have that mixture in it. So then what we do is we film them after the class. So you can see how their presentation changed and it's mind boggling, you know, how you can change presentations just by creating confidence and when they're in control on stage. So it takes time to learn that, but once you learn, there's levels to it, right? You keep learning and keep becoming better and better, uh, but it's very important for you to just do it. And that's, that's the key point to everything is that embrace change, embrace fear, uh, and realize that yesterday has already happened. Nothing you can do to change it. You can learn from it. Don't live in the past, okay? Because otherwise you'll be depressed all day long. Yeah. If you said I missed the stock market, or don't live in the future where you're worried about something that hasn't even happened. It's in your imagination. I think it's important since our conscious mind can only deal with five to nine bits of information at a time. It is very, very important that we stay in the now. The now is the only thing that matters in the world. Now is where everything's at. Now is where all your relationships are at. Now. Because 10 minutes from now, nobody is seen. Two days from now, nobody is seen. We don't even know we're going to see it. But we are, we know we're going to be in the now. So today, a lot of things have changed, right? You go to dinner, you see everybody on their phone. They're texting back and forth. And now is very hard to get to. The now is more valuable than ever before because nobody's in the now. Everybody's either in the tomorrow or they keep talking about yesterday. So if I can give your listeners one tip is that if you focus on the now, that's living life. If, if you don't, then you, that's something that you really have to work towards of being in the moment, in the moment of what you're doing. Today, people take videos of their food so they can show everybody for what they experienced, which they didn't even experience because what they experienced was taking the video of the food to experience it later, yep. which, which is yep. a whole different subject. Yeah, a whole different subject. Yeah, that's very true. You're right. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you for sharing that. That's very important. I think I think it's, it, it, it's a constant struggle, especially for those of us that are aware to live in the now. I know it is for me because my mind is so trained into the future so much because I enjoy, again, the pain and pleasure, right? I enjoy the goal setting, looking forward to things that I often do miss the now. Um, so I, I consciously have to remind myself, and especially when it comes to spending time with family, I've changed that so much that phone is off, everything is off. I actually leave my phone upstairs in my office. I was like, it's family time. Because when my son was growing up, 
I didn't do that. It was just constantly, I was with him, but I was not with him. Not mentally. I was there physically, but not mentally, spiritually. And, and it's an important factor to pay attention to that because when you're present, they feel your presence. And my daughter is 19 months old. Oh my God, Sam. She, when you're on the phone, she knows and she goes off, off because she, she wants you to be present. And uh, there's so many lessons we could learn from kids. And thank you for bringing that out and, and sharing that. Anything, nope. yeah, anything you want to share in terms of um, like where people can find you? I know you're working on a book and I know you have some audio uh, on Amazon. Yeah, I already have a book out called Mind Power Unleash. I have uh, two new books that are going to be released. Uh, one is called Never Give Up um, and The Psychology of the Comeback. And that book was written to with a lot, a lot of people in history that have lost everything and what they did to make their comeback. So it's different stories about different people from Abraham Lincoln to Walt Disney, uh, really fascinating uh, stories in there. And then the, the Prince That Will Never Come, The Psychology of Love. Uh, and uh, that's all about, it sounds like a negative title, but it's really not. It's about how important communication and self-love is. Uh, and it goes really deep in that. And the book that's out that you can get is uh, Mind Power Unleashed. Uh, it's on Amazon. You know, you can go out there. But my website is uh, samchahan.com, or you can go to mindsetforce.com. But Sam Chahan is S-A-M-C-H-A-U-H-A-N.com. Um, you know, I'm the owner of the event Mindset Summit that we just had. Um, and the next one will be in April, which will be in Miami. But uh, that's how you can find me. And if you go on my website, um, you can just put in your email and you guys can get my psychological blog that I send out uh, once a month. And for your, for your summit, is it like open to everybody and they could just yeah. book that? Okay. And that's coming up yeah. and you said in May? No. Well, so we just did our last week. So I had Rob O'Neill, the Navy SEAL that killed Osama bin Laden. The next one will be in April in Miami. In Miami. Okay. In Miami. Okay. And, um, and Mary, you need to be there. Yes, that's why I asked. Um, I'm going to check it out for sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, well, I appreciate you having me on the show. I'm oh, very grateful. Pleasure is all mine. And thank you so much for your great contribution. And I know you and I helped, even if just one person today, we've done a great job. So that's all. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Unleash Your Potential with Mary Nawabi. To find out more about Mary or to invite her as a keynote speaker at your next corporate event, visit marynawabi.com.